Hi, my name is Valerie Elkins. I'm a professional genealogist, family history expert, international speaker and author, and I'm so pleased that Mayflower Promise has asked me to give this short presentation about Mayflower and their descendants, which I'm very happy to do so. So let me um, switch to squ screen share so that you can see my screen. So this is my 11th great grandfather, Edward Fuller and his wife. And I'm also related through their son, Samuel Fuller, and very happy and pleased to be a descendant from Mayflower and their descendants. Many US presidents can claim to be descendants from the Mayflower, including from John Adams to George W. Bush, along with three vice presidents, five statesmen, and 13 state governors, famous pilots and astronauts like Amelia Earhart, the Wright brothers, and Alan Shepard, famous writers like Longfellow, Emerson, Hemingway, Steinbeck, Thoreau, Louis, Laura Ingalls Wilder, were all descendants, as well as many famous actors and actresses, and many famous musicians and world leaders like Sir Winston Churchill. What a loss to the world if these people had never been born. Mayflower programs with the largest number of descendants, that award would go to John and Priscilla Mullen, followed by William and Mary Brewster, and John Rowland and Elizabeth Tilly. But the Mayflower is more than just a boat, a famous rock, pilgrims who dressed in funky clothes, and a reason to eat turkey. The pilgrims were known as separatists in England, and they were arrested and persecuted for their religious beliefs, and they fled Holland, where they did experience some religious tolerance, but with the threats of war with Spain, they came to realize that in order to preserve their religion and their culture, they were going to have to leave Holland for the New World. A very dangerous decision. A decision that they probably, they knew the dangers, and they knew, as over 50% died in the attempt to obtain their religious freedom. That's one in every two people would survive their first year. But maybe they felt like Gimli did from Lord of the Rings when he said, Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? So look at, let's look at Mayflower by the numbers. 400 years ago this month, pilgrims landed in Plymouth, 102 passengers with 30 crew members. Five died in the crossing, 45 died and failed to survive their first winter there due to the harsh elements and not having adequate protection from the cold and elements. 26 families have known descendants with over 35 million Mayflower descendants throughout the world today. Why should we remember and celebrate the Mayflower's 400th anniversary? Because it's not just about the pilgrims and their quest for religious freedom. Inspired by the faith and courage of the pilgrims, other religious groups followed, to, followed their lead to obtain religious freedom and escape persecution. The Swiss Anabaptists, who became the Mennonites and the Amish, Catholics, Lutherans, Quakers, and Jews, all came to America seeking refuge in the freedom to worship. If we want our religious freedoms protected, then we have to protect the religious freedoms of all. Norman Rockwell, a famous American artist and Saturday Evening Post illustrator for over 30 years and a descendant of William Brewster and John Howland. After World War II, he created a series of four posters that were what he called the four freedoms that were worth fighting for. The first one was the freedom of speech. The freedom of speech to write and have different, to speak and to write and have different opinions from those of the government and those of the majority. Certainly Robert Payne, signer of the Declaration of Independence, founder of Pennsylvania Abolition Society, Massachusetts' first attorney general and devout Christian descendant of Stephen Hopkins, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He knew he was putting his life on the line to defend those rights. The second right was the freedom from fear, freedom from reprisals, from violence, from threatening forces that would strive to remove our freedoms. 
certainly General Leonard Wood agreed. He was a U.S. Army General, Medal of Honor recipient, Chief of Staff of the Army, and Governor General of the Mayflower Society, as he was the descendant of four different Mayflower pilgrims. The, one of the third right was the freedom from want, freedom to provide shelter, food, necessity of life, of life is the right of everyone in our country should be assured of. Julia Child worked in uh, as an OSS, uh, the precursor to the CIA in, in the war as a spy during World War II. Do you know she developed a shark repellent to stop sharks from setting off underwater explosives that's still in use today? She wrote the classic cookbook, Mastering of French Cooking, and was a pioneer in TV programming teaching cooking. She was a descendant of William Bradford and William Brewster. Julia believed that not only in our right was it to have food, to have that food taste good. I agree with you, Julia. Arts to fight for, it was the fourth freedom, it was the freedom of religion. Re the first amendment, the very first amendment of our country is the freedom of religion. It is the freedom to believe. No one should be criticized, persecuted, or attacked by individuals or governments either for what they believe about God, nor in practicing their religion. Our religious faith is very personal and very important freedom for us to fight for. And certainly Bishop Philip Brooks, Episcopal clergyman, Bishop of Massachusetts, lyricist <coughs> of a, a little town of Bethlehem, was a descendant of William Brewster and John Holland agreed. Joseph Smith, founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, formerly known as the Mormons, he was named one of the 100 most significant Americans of all time by the Smithsonian. And he was martyred for his religion. And he was a descendant of Edward Fuller and John Holland. Joseph Smith said, I am bold to declare that before heaven, that I am just as ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any other denomination as for a Mormon. For the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the Latter-day Saints would trample upon the rights of the Roman Catholics or of any other denomination that who may be unpopular and too weak to defend themselves. It is a love of liberty which inspires my soul, civil and religious liberty to the whole of the human race. The freedom to worship according to the dictates of our own conscience is a freedom as Americans we cherish. Religious freedoms are paramount among our fa fundamental rights. Sensitive tools are necessary to balance the demands of religious liberty with the just interests of society. Elder David R. Bednar said, gathering, in short, is at the core of faith and religion. Indeed, if the faithful are not gathering, sooner or later, they will begin to scatter. And because gathering lies at the very heart of religion, the right to gather lies at the very heart of religious freedom. Recent newspaper polls find that half of U.S. adults who are attending church before COVID-19 are unlikely to return to church even if it is deemed safe. More people feel very to somewhat comfortable going to restaurants more than attending in-person church service. One in three practicing Christians are still attending their pre-COVID church. So how did this happen? How did religion become deemed unessential while services like bars are deemed essential? Football games and other entertainment and events are allowed to take place while a Catholic priest is being barred giving last rites, even if that person did not have COVID. Are these practices reasonable or discriminatory? Government officials say that singing is one of the things that makes church gatherings so dangerous. Justice Kavanaugh asked how it can be for a person to go grocery shopping, but not to church, to encounter a delivery person, but not a minister. <clears throat> Angela Carmella, a professor of law, brings up valid points when she asks, yet no other indoor activities have similar blends, including schools, protests, malls, and entertainment productions, only worship services. The ban still applies, even if the congregation is socially distanced and masked. 
if singing is such a high risk activity, even with safety protocols in place, why are no other indoor activities similarly restricted? Doesn't the First Amendment guarantee the worship will be not singled out for repression? A picture on the left was taken at my lo local Costco just last week. Can, are people telling me that's safer than going to church? Protecting a person's physical health from coronavirus is of course important, but so is a person's spiritual health. We're finding more and more people suffering from being alone, the emotional stress from not having the support of loved ones and spiritual help is causing a serious problem for many people. Isn't it discriminatory when casinos are allowed to operate at 50% of capacity while churches are limited to 50 worshipers? You see, we're seeing a rise in attacks of religious beliefs. The large part of Amy Barrett's confirmation hearings were spent defending attacks against her religious beliefs rather than focusing on her professional qualifications. Thomas Paine said, spiritual freedom is the root of all political liberty. As the union between spiritual freedom and political liberty seem nearly inseparable, it is our duty to defend both. Speaking of Thomas Paine and altering the words of his famous quote, I think that which we deem too lightly, we give up too quickly. We need to value our religious freedom more highly. From natural disasters to a deadly pandemic sweeping the globe to a most pernicious social plague of social of racism, we are daily reminded that we need to awaken to the perilous times that surround us, come to ourselves, and arise and turn to our divine Father who desires to instruct and edify us through our trials. People used to hire people like me, a, a genealogist, to help them be able to join lineage societies, especially to determine and discover if they were a Mayflower descendant. People back in the day felt that being a descendant of the Mayflower meant that they were maybe more American or more blue blood or elitist. That certainly is not the case today. While we should be very proud to be a descendant of the Mayflower or any other virtuous and righteous and good honorable men and women. But I wonder when I think about the Mayflower ancestors, would they be proud of us today? We have a legacy and a responsibility as Americans to continue to uphold the right to practice our religion. People of faith need to stand up for religious freedom by becoming informed, speaking up and getting involved in cultural, civic and political organizations and events. This 400th anniversary is an opportunity to not forget their sacrifice, but honor it by all we do and what we can make sure that the religious freedom is continued to be our rights as American descendants and citizens. So do you wanna discover if you're one of the 35 million descendants of the Mayflower or just discover your own family history? Three great places to get started, FamilySearch.org, AmericanAncestors.org, or the MayflowerSociety.org all have free or resources and tools and plenty of help available to help you get started in climbing your family tree. If you need help or assistance or questions I can answer, feel free to go to my website and I'll do what I can to point you in the right direction. Thank you again to the Mayflower Promise for all they're doing to celebrate this 400th anniversary and the heritage of religious freedom in America. So I want you to know that I'm really grateful to be an American citizen. Crazy times we're living in right now. I'm so grateful that I have prayer and my religion, my faith to strengthen me during this time. I know God answers prayers and is mindful of us. So I ask all of you say a prayer for our country and for our leaders and that do all we can to continue to pray for our religious freedoms. Thank you.